uh, of NARS start from the very beginning. Uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, this short course will focus on the logic used in the system, even though we are also going to talk about control mechanism later. Uh, the logic uh, consists of nine layers. Uh, we start from the foundation, so it's not axiomatic logic layer one. Uh, or you can say that's the core logic of the whole NARS system. Uh, but before we actually talking about this logic, we are going to introduce another logic first, okay, which is a highly idealized or simplified version of, of now. Uh, later you're going to see why this is necessary. Okay? But just we just start from here. Uh, first, some basic idea. Uh, I assume you already know uh, some kind of uh, logic system uh, roughly speaking, in this context, when we say we define a logic, it basically means three things. Uh, first is the formal language, okay? uh, a group of grammar rules, which specify how uh, to write a sentence uh, in this logic. Second is the set of inference rules, which specify how to derive new sentence from given sentence. And finally, uh, a semantic theory which explains uh, what the language means, why the inference rules are valid. Okay. So that's what we're going to do exactly uh, for, for both of the logic system we're going to introduce today. So first, uh, the formal language. Uh, I assume you're all familiar with first order predicate calculators, where uh, the basic form of uh, say atomic proposition typically take the form of a predicate name followed by an argument list, right? And this is the name of a predicate which typically uh, specifies some kind of re uh, relation. And then this is a list of arguments which can either be a constant or a variable. Okay. Uh, and then th this represents there's some kind of relationship. Uh, Later, they introduce connectives and then variables okay, and so on. Okay. So that's kind of like the basic of a predicate calculus. Uh, what I use in my system is very different from this tradition. Instead, it's something called term logic. Even if you may haven't heard about this phrase, you know this kind of thing. This in history is a more uh, ancient form of logic. It's uh, in Aristotle's uh, syllogistic. So what makes this different from this? We start from representation. Term logic use subject predicate sentence. So every sentence in this kind of logic Roughly speaking, have this format. That is, mm -hmm. there is a subject, there is a predicate. And both of them are called the terms. That's where the, the name term logic come from in the first place. And these two are related to each other by something called a copula. Okay. Uh, this term is used both in linguistics and in logic with uh, similar meaning. Okay. So intuitively speaking, uh, you say something is a type of something else. Okay, that, that, that's, that's the intuitive meaning. So accurately speaking, let's see, in my logic, how these things are defined. First, uh, there is a definition of all the, the lecture note on this kind of thing is relatively brief and informal. So the accurate definition can be found in the book, of course, uh, which is the reading material we use here.
bekommen. Okay, here we go. Uh, first, let's define a term in this context. Here, term is nothing but uh, a string of character, okay, which can be taken from any alphabet. In this book, of course, I'm using English, but uh, there is no reason why it cannot use, say, Chinese or something else. So at the very beginning, uh, the simplest form of a term uh, is just a word. Like it's, uh, then the simplest form of copular in this case is what I call a inheritance relation. So uh, in a book, you use a single arrowhead. So this whole thing to together is called a statement uh, in this logic. Or to be more accurate, you can call it the inheritance statement. And S will be called the subject term, and P the predicate term. Uh, the intuitive meaning, later we're going to define the accurate meaning, but the intuitive meaning is S is a special type of P. Or you can say P is a general form of S. Uh, concrete example, you can say a bird is a type of animal so that it just looks like this. Okay. It sounds trivial. And clearly this thing is related to first, first order predicate calculus uh, formula like this for all X. Okay. Uh, here, I treat bird and animal both as single argument predicate. Okay. If something is a bird, then that something is an animal. Uh, also, the intuition actually, in this system, actually come from set theory. Uh, at the very beginning, I actually used the subset relation instead of the inheritance. Okay. Uh, but later, we will see this. Now, it's become not exactly the same even though intuitively it's still related to that thing. So, but exactly why uh, I say this is different from first order predicate calculus for representation uh, and uh, set theory representation, well, you'll see this is the definition. This copular is defined in, in the current form as completely by, by its two property. First is reflexive, second is transitive, nothing else. Okay. And also is defined between terms. It's not defined between, uh, say, sets or something else. Okay. That's, that's why this one is, uh, accurately speaking, different from the, the other relation I just mentioned, even though it's kind of similar. And uh, and that's it. So you see, this language is very simple for this logic. Okay. Uh, you see, every statement is a term and a copular and another term. Uh, a copular is just this inheritance thing. A term is nothing but a word. Uh, so that's the uh, grammar rule for what I call an inheritance logic, which is also built layer by layer, used uh, in the first layer of this inheritance logic. Then, semantics. And things become a little bit more uh, interesting, even though it's still very simple. Okay? First, you see this inheritance logic itself is a binary logic, meaning that every statement is either true or false. So here, I say the truth value of a statement in this inheritance logic is either true or false. Uh, uh, 
then according to the definition, I said the, the inheritance uh, copular is reflexive and transitive, which already gave us uh, the following two theorem. Okay. First, for every x which is a term okay, in a certain uh, field, uh, then there is an inheritance relation from x to itself, which is always true. That's the definition. Uh, also, another theorem is the transitivity, right? If there is an inheritance relation from x to y, uh, from y to z, then from them, uh, you can decide that there is also a relation from x to z. Okay? Simple transitivity. So that uh, if you represent the same thing in uh, predicate calculus, you're going to write it in this form, which you're familiar with already. Then I introduced the notion of idealized experience or ideal experience. Okay. Later we will see uh, there are other types of experience uh, of the system. But first let's think about the ideal situation, which by definition is nothing but a finite non-empty set of statements of the language we just defined. So, intuitive meaning is very simple. What I call experience is nothing but the given knowledge for the system from the very beginning. Okay. You see, any reasoning system must start from some given knowledge. You cannot just derive things from nowhere, right? Uh, so for that given experience, uh, a given knowledge I call experience. Later we'll see why I use this term. Okay. For now we just take that as a definition. So, so this is an example. Uh, you can tell the system at the very beginning, and beyond that, you assume the system knows nothing. Okay. Uh, so you can tell the system, Robin is a kind of bird, bird is a kind of animal, uh, water is a kind of liquid, and things like that. So for people familiar with uh, graph theory, you can clearly see that uh, here we can easily represent every node, uh, rep every term as a node, and every Statement is a link from one node to another, right? So that uh, a given experience is nothing but a directed graph. It doesn't have to be connected. In this case, clearly, it's not connected, right? So uh, I have something like this in this example. Okay? So that's the experience. And then for a given experience, the, the next thing I, I want to do, uh, define is the system's knowledge. So what the system knows. That's the transitive closure of the experience. Again, this terminology comes from uh, graph theory. I assume you are familiar with it. Uh, if you are not, well, it's basically uh, what the system can derive from the given. Okay. According to what? According to, of course, the property of the copula, which is transitive. Okay. So you see in this example, uh, I tell the system, Robin is a kind of bird, and bird is a kind of animal, and also I tell it, uh, water is a kind of liquid. Then, given the transitivity, the system can clearly derive, uh, so Robin is a type of animal. And that's the only thing, uh, it can be derived. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. The way I, I've, in, in, in my experience with object orientation and so forth, you make a big distinction between a class and an instance. Are, are you combining them? Uh, we are going to talk about that in the future, but uh, here at this stage, there is no such a concept of a class and instance. Everything is a term. Okay? And that notion actually is introduced in the second layer. The first layer is just a whole bunch of words. Uh, related to each other, uh, just by one type of relation, that's the inheritance relation, okay? nothing else. But uh, you're right, clearly we are going to introduce that kind of thing uh, for more complicated knowledge. Okay? But for now, it's flat, okay? perfectly flat. So, so after I add this thing in, uh, this k become this k star, 
which is uh, what does this one know according to uh, the given. Okay. And of course, in certain situation, this one and this one are actually the same if there's nothing can be derived, okay, uh, which is possible. So you always have this. Okay. That's uh, easy to see. Uh, so this is the K, this is the K star. And again, since this, both of them are defined as sets, there is no outer uh, amount of statement in it, and there is no duplicate, right? Just like in ordinary set theory. Then what? Then we can use this definition to decide the truth value of any arbitrary statement according to a given experience. Again, it's kind of obvious. Okay, you see, according to given experience, the truth value of a statement can either be true or false in this case. It's binary. Okay? In what situation is it true? Well, there are two possibilities. One possibility is, is here. So that's either the given or can be derived from the given. Okay? Otherwise, there is another possibility for it to be true. That is, uh, it is a tautology. Meaning that, uh, say, for example, bird is a type of bird. Well, of course, uh, by definition, that, that's always true. Okay? Uh, other than that, everything else will be defined to be false. So people, uh, for, for the people who are familiar with uh, AI, you'll see that this logic also uh, accept the so-called closed world assumption. Uh, it's basically, uh, because we are talking about a binary logic, everything can either be true or false, nothing else. So if something is not true, uh, well, it will have to be false. Okay? Uh, so that's the so-called closed world assumption, uh, which is used here. Then a few other definitions first. Uh, I define the vocabulary of a system according to given uh, experience to be the set of all the terms that appear in experience. Okay? Clearly, in this case, the, the vocabulary is nothing but uh, the set contains those five words. It's basically what the system knows okay? uh, according to the given experience. So that's the vocabulary. Also very easy. And this one is a very important definition. Okay? It's not that easy. Actually, uh, it's not, it's kind of like different from uh, many other uh, usage of this pair of terms. Uh, you see here, I begin to define the extension and the intention. Uh, this pair of terms you are going to uh, see again and again and again. They play an important role uh, in this logic. So make sure you understand. So this are the formal definition, which looks uh, complicated. But if you, you, you check it carefully, actually it's pretty simple. Uh, for example, for a given term, you see extension and intention are always defined with respect to a given term. Okay? For example, in this case, Let's concentrate on bird. What is the extension of bird? Well, by definition, it's a set of terms which are in the vocabulary. And also, there is an inheritance relation from it to bird. Okay. Or intuitively speaking, the extension of a, of a term and more specific terms according to the system's experience. So in this case, clearly, Robin is in the extension of a bird. Okay. Also, be careful, also bird itself. Because, you know, it's a tautology, so this is, this is always true, and also clearly bird is in the vocabulary. Okay. So in this example, the extension of bird is this one, this one, in a set, intention is a pure symmetric on the other side. That is, the intention 
and the more general terms in the vocabulary. So in this case, the intention of bird is animal, again, bird itself. Well, how about water is a type of liquid which is not related to anything else? Well, then it becomes trivial. Then water includes nothing uh, but water itself. Both is an extension and intention. Uh, the same thing for liquid. Okay. So it's still it's a very simple definition. Uh, here, uh, there is some redoubtable for a term which is not in experience. Then both intention and extension will be empty. Uh, by definition, and you see this is the, the given example. Okay, for 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 the terms that in the experience or in the vocabulary, that the extension and intention are given, uh, in a way. And then extension and intention put together is called the meaning of a term. Again, that's a crucial semantic definition, which we're going to see again and again in the future. Okay. So this is probably the a major uh, point which different uh, my system from most of the other logics. Okay. And the people who are familiar with logic knows that uh, traditionally uh, extension uh, indicate the thing in the world of a a certain term. For example, a bird. The extension of the actual birds in the world for this term. Uh, on the other hand, intention is typically uh, related to the notion or you know, platonic world uh, related to, to this thing. Okay? Uh, in this system, both extension and intention are defined by other terms. And also clearly you can see that this relation is perfectly symmetric. right? If I'm in your extension, then you're in my intention. Right? Uh, it's always like that. And also, all the following conclusion will satisfy that condition. So these two are perfectly symmetric with respect to each other. And another thing important is here, now you see meaning and truth value are both defined with respect to what? To the system's experience. So that's very different from the traditional, for example, model theoretic semantics, where typically say, what's the meaning of bird? Well, it's what it refers to in a model or in a, uh, in a world. Okay. But in this system, roughly speaking, the meaning of a bird is what the system know about birds. Okay. Later we'll see, again, this one have very significant implication in many other things uh, in the system. So that is why I say the semantics is used by uh, both uh, now and uh, uh, IL is called experience grounded semantics. Okay. True, false, meaning, blah, blah, blah. Uh, all defined with respect to a given experience. If you switch to a different experience, meaning change, truth value change, may change at least. Okay? And also you see, especially, some people say, oh, since experience is given, uh, it looks lo just like axioms. What's the big deal? Well, at this stage, yeah, it's roughly the same. But later we'll see that experience can expand over time. Okay. So you're going to get more things into it uh, from moment to moment, which you typically don't allow the axioms to be, to be handled in that way. Okay. Uh, and also later we'll see experience doesn't have to be consistent. Even though at the current stage, it is consistent because, you know, it's just, it just a given a directed graph. Okay. Uh, there's no way for you to introduce inconsistency in this graph because uh, you see negative statements are not represented directly. Okay? It's just what, whatever you didn't mention, that's false. Whatever you mention will be true. Okay? For example, is rubbing a, a type of water? Well, it's not, right? Because there is no link from this one to this one. Uh, so, 
So that's kind of like the, the basic idea behind this uh, experience grounded semantics, which is so simple, right? Too simple to, to be interesting. Uh, then later you will see all of this simple definition are uh, uh, my way to prepare for the more complicated stuff. Okay? This theorem is more important than everything else before it. Uh, here I establish two equivalence relations between three things. This thing says that uh, there is an inheritance relation from S to P. That's the thing we have been talking about. Okay? Uh, then I say, that's the case if and only if. Here I'm using a, a propositional calculus uh, as the matter language of, of, of the, this logic. Okay. If and only if the extension of S is a subset of the extension of P. Also, if and only if the intention of P is a subset of the intention of S. This thing can be easily proved using the transitivity and reflexivity uh, of, the, of the inheritance copular. Okay. And also, uh, I have simple pro uh, proof of all the theorems in the book uh, at the end uh, as a, one of the appendix of the book. Okay. But uh, they're all pretty simple. It's easy to prove by yourself. So, okay, that's also this one is very easy to see. That if there is the inheritance relation from this one to this one, then if there is something else linked to this, by transitivity, that thing will also link to this. That's for sure. And the other way around. Okay? And also, if I, this one is linked to this by transitivity, then this one will also link to this. Uh, given the definition of extension and intention, that directly leads to this result. Right And, and from this one, you can see that uh, uh, if the extension of two things are the same, then their intention will also be the same. That is, if one of the subset relations become an equal relation, then uh, that will derive the other thing. Okay? Uh, and also, in this situation, according to my previous definition, I will say that S and P have the same meaning. If they have the same extension, then they will have the same intention. And the meaning is nothing but the extension and intention. Okay, putting together. And this one is easy to get. That's the semantics. Then inference rules. Again, this logic only have one inference rule. That's nothing but the transitivity of the inheritance relation. Okay, which we have been using even though we didn't call it uh, inheritance uh, uh, inference rule, which say that this inference rule will take two premise and derive a conclusion. And this two premise need to, sh uh, to be two uh, inheritance statement with one common term. Furthermore, the common term need to be the subject of one statement and the predicate of another one. Okay. And then the final so that's something like So the general pattern will be something like this. This is if if you already know this, you derive that. And that's very similar to Aristotle's syllogistic uh, at least uh, the simplest form of it. So that's another reason why we see this is a term logic. Uh, later we will see what uh, the difference between this thing and how you do uh, inference in predicate calculus. So you see, uh, I used uh, several different format for inference rule in the book. Sometimes I use this format. Sometimes I use the other format. Uh, something like this. There is no real difference. Uh, you just say that from this side, you derive this conclusion. And uh, which is the only inference rule. But there is another rule. Uh, I don't really have a good name, so, but I, I call it a matching rule. That's basically 
what, what kind of question this system can answer? If it's this simple, okay? You see, basically, if you give the system this, you can just use any algorithm in graph theory which generate a transitive closure from, uh, from a, a given graph, directed graph, to produce this, right? Then, according to this, for any arbitrary inheritance relation, you can decide its truth value. Just a look up table and see whether this thing is in it or not. Okay? If it's in it, it's true. Otherwise, it's false. And also, for any given term, you can decide its intention and extension by just go through everything with this format or this format. And then, what kind of question you can answer? You'll see that uh, at least we can answer two types of questions given the previous uh, defined logic. First is what, what we typically call a uh, yes-no question. Okay? You can ask the system whether there is a relation, inheritance relation, from a given x to a given y. Okay? Uh, so you can put a question mark there. Say, is that the case? then the answer will be yes or no. Okay? According to whether this kind of thing can be found in the knowledge. And yeah, in the book I'm using this format, of course. I put the question mark at the end. And another type of question is what we call uh, what type of question. Okay? Uh, which in this case, we'll have two different formats. Okay. This is basically asking for what is in the extension of x, uh, what is in the intention of x, respectively. Question? Uh, this does this indicate uh, reflexivity to cost. You just check if uh, the sentence is in A star. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, actually here I said uh, uh, I don't take reflexivity uh, into account because uh, a tautology for this two question, a tautology will be a trivial answer uh, because this is always true. Okay, so you don't even want to ask. It's a trivial answer, but it's a correct answer. It's, it's a correct answer, but uh, my, my rule will only pick, you're right that it doesn't pick all true answer. It only pick what I call empirical true. Okay, that is the truth value is established according to yeah, the experience. And then you can also check whether it's analytically true, and then, then you can check it that way. Okay. So yeah, I think I mentioned that thing somewhere before, but I didn't uh, repeat that here. So clearly, uh, for this and this, uh, very often the, the answer is not unique. Uh, there is more than one thing in, in that experience or uh, in that essential or intention of a given term. If that's the case, then any of them is equally valid. Okay. Uh, what if x is not, uh, there is nothing empirically established, uh, then the system will just answer no. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, in the current implementation, I block that. Uh, later, we will see. Uh, in the systems, uh, uh, this inheritance logic is not really implemented at all. It's introduced as part of the meta uh, lang language to define this. Okay, later, we will see that. Uh, in this one, I don't allow truth. I already mentioned that yesterday. So, so how about this? This is indeed true. You cannot say it's not. Well, I just don't allow it to be said in the system. Okay. Uh, later we will see. Well, if that's the case, how can you handle mathematics, which is uh, you know true by definition? Yes, I can handle that, but in a different way, not not at this level. Okay. So, so.
So that's the, the, the matching rule. That is, this knowledge, if it's in the system's knowledge, then it can be used to answer three forms of questions. That's it. That's the very first logic system we introduced. Very simple. Okay, it doesn't really do much thing interesting. But you see the whole function of this is to provide the logical foundation for the next one, which is indeed not axiomatic. This one, on the other hand, actually, in a sense, is axiomatic because I didn't take insufficient knowledge and resource into consideration at all. For example, I assume the system has the resource to produce the transitive closure. Okay? Uh, in general, if I assume real-time working, I should, not, I should not assume that's always possible to be produced. Okay? But again, this one is the idealized form. Okay? It's a binary tools, enough resource to do whatever, and also there is enough time for you to do this big lookup, no matter how big that table is. Okay. Now we are going to move into the real thing. And then you're going to see why we want to do that first. Okay. And now, in a sense, we can say this thing is a modification of this thing by what? By really take insufficient knowledge and resource into consideration. Okay. So this is an idealized version of this. This is kind of like a practical version of this, roughly speaking. Okay. But the reality, of course, is a little bit more complicated than that. But still, even though this one is simple, it already established the three most important uh, things that separate this logic from the traditional. That is, the language is term-oriented, is subject-predicate, which is very, very important for this system. Okay? And this thing, it just doesn't work. Later we'll see why I make that strong claim. Okay? Second, it introduced the experience-grounded semantics, which say that true or false or meaning are all defined not with respect to a model, but respect to the system's experience. Finally, the inference rule is syllogistic, meaning that intuitively speaking, it always have this form, or the most typical uh, inference rule in the system, okay? Always have this form. Or in terms of graph, you see that the inference rule in the system does nothing but make some kind of triangle all the time, okay? If there is an edge, if there is an edge, and it's going to build another edge here, okay? Most of the typical rules can be, can be remembered in that form. Again, that is not the case in predicate calculus or propositional calculus. Okay. So after the preparation, now let's move into this one. Here, the first most important notion, conceptually speaking, is the concept of evidence. This is a term we use all the time, right? When we talk about reasoning, argumentation, uh, justification, it should be related to logic closely, but if you check traditional logic, there's, in most of the system, the notion of evidence does not exist. Okay. Why? Well, there's some philosophical level discussion. There's some very important lesson we, 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 we need to learn from this. So what is evidence? Roughly speaking, evidence is a chunk of knowledge or information, whatever you call it, according to which the truth value of a certain proposition can be estimated or determined or whatever you call it. Okay? So let's say this thing has a truth value. And this evidence will tell you, in a sense, the truth value. Okay? 
or at least that's what my, my logic is supposed to do. You see, yesterday I already mentioned there is nothing absolutely true because the system have insufficient knowledge, but the system still knows something. Insufficient knowledge doesn't mean no knowledge, right? If there is no knowledge at all, then every behavior can be equally justified or equally random, okay? So you have evidence means that you know something about this thing. But this is very different from the credit bounding concept in traditional logic, which is what? Which is proof. In traditional logic, proof is the way to establish a truth value, right? What's the difference between evidence and the proof in terms of decide truth value? Intuitively speaking, before you learn any logic, you know, when we say we have a proof, it's kind of like your result is conclusive. You know, you, you, you can prove this is true, and then it will stay true, right? If you can prove it's a false, it will stay false. It's, it's extreme and conclusive. You have problem settled. On the other hand, evidence is much weaker than that. You have some evidence about the truth value. Then you, you can put a number there. But you may get some other evidence, which will force you to modify that number. So evidence also gives you some information about the truth value of something. But first, it's not extreme, meaning that it doesn't necessarily push it to completely true or completely false. Second, it's not conclusive. Because typically, no evidence can settle this thing down forever. But intuitively, we know there's some good evidence, some not so good evidence, there's some strong evidence, some, some weak evidence. All those kind of things will need to be taken into consideration. Question? Uh, so this evidence is more like to the evidence in the Bayesian inference. Do you use it to modify the Bayesian? In a sense, yes. Yes, but later we are going to see there are also some fundamental difference. Okay. Yes, it's more like Bayesian uh, evidence than, say, classical proof, for sure. But evidence is something which is not very easy to be introduced into logic. Based on that work, after all, is not a logic. Yeah. Uh, there, there, why? Well, that, that's a long story I don't have the time to go into. But if you want to do this research, there are many people who have tried to combine probability theory and the first order predicate calculators. Basically, they think first order predicate calculators can be extended from binary into multi-valued, and that multi-value is nothing but probability. It's much harder than it sounds. It sounds very intuitive, okay, this idea. Uh, many people have tried with limited success, uh, but there are all kinds of troubles, yeah. Okay. Uh, part of the reason is because first order calculator, uh, calculators or first order predicate uh, logic and the probability theory are based on very different fundamental assumptions. Okay. Uh, in a sense, they are not really completely compatible with each other. So when you try to combine things together, that's kind of like the integrative approach of AGI I mentioned yesterday. Okay. There's some fundamental difference and you need to have find a way to handle. Okay. So anyway, Let's see. Yeah, in the book, I have more discussion about the previous related work and so on. Uh, we are going to skip that and directly go to the constructive part. How to say, what if we say this one is no longer completely true or completely false? It's a matter of degree. OK, that sounds simple. But what that number means? You say, well, clearly, most people say, we can, we can extend the truth value from this binary situation very naturally into a real number interval. Say, this one is this, this one is this. Then we also allow a lot of things in between, right? That's the intuition shared by many people. Okay? Um, say, probabilistic logic or fuzzy logic, all that kind of idea. 
come from this intuition. But the point here, the key point is not to do that, it's just to explain what's that number me measure. Okay. In this case, I clearly wanted to measure kind of like evidential support. Okay, the relationship between this and a body of evidence, the system already collected. Okay. Again, how? Well, that's the previous theorem. I told you it's important. That's one. I say this three sentences are equivalent to each other, meaning that they have the same meaning, or they should have the same truth value, right? So that if this one become a matter of degree, then this and this also need to become, or may become a matter of degree. Okay? And this is introduced exactly for this purpose. That is, to make this thing a matter of degree, Intuitively speaking, it's much easier than that. Okay? Because that's something new we just defined. This is what? This is a subset relation. Okay? Subset relation can be binary. Or it can clearly be extended into partial. Okay? So how to, so this is say, S is a subset of P. And this one is say, well, it's sort of, it's a matter of degree, okay? The, the how to measure that degree? Well, you just check everything in S to see what's the percent of it which is also in P. Okay? Why? Because this part agree with this judgment. This part disagree with it. But now you don't want binary logic so that whenever you find a counter evidence, you don't say that thing is completely wrong. You want numerically or quantitatively measure your evidence, which later we'll see is absolutely necessary for a system working with insufficient knowledge and resource. Okay? Because if you don't use a numerical truth value, then you also you don't allow absolute true or absolutely false. Then everything else will become the third value in between. So three value logic is correct, but far from enough. Everything becomes possible, possible. Okay? It doesn't give you any guidance. So, okay, so now we are going to do that. And that, if you understand the, this intuition, you can directly understand the definition of evidence used in NARS. That's this definition. The positive evidence are the evidence that's in the common extension or common intention of the two sets or two terms. Like in this case, if we concentrate on Oh, by the way, this is a, just an intuitive picture, okay? This is not an accurate representation of this one. Because why? Because S and P are not terms, are, are not sets, okay? They're terms. But their extension and intention are sets, okay? So my bad, I need to be, if I want to be more accurate, I should say this is the extension of the two things. Then you can draw that picture. Okay, so you'll see this is nothing but the common extension of S and the P. And everything here will support the conclusion that the extension of S is a subset of extension of P, which is equivalent to the statement that there is an inheritance relation from S to P. Okay. On the other hand, if you have something in the extension of S, but not in the extension of P, that's negative evidence. Okay. So in this picture, to be more accurate, what we have is this. From a pure extensional point of view, the, 
these are the positive evidence. And these are the negative evidence. How about this? This is irrelevant. Okay. Then intention is symmetric. So you have the intention of P, then you have the intention of S, and these are the positive evidence, and these are the negative evidence. Okay. That's exactly what this definition says. And also another important thing is uh, this thing you see, uh, evidence can come either from the extension side or from the intention side. Okay. Later, we'll see, at this level, you can still separate them. Later, when I do measurement, I actually mix them together. That's another important decision, which I'm going to explain why in, in the future. It looks in counterintuitive at the very beginning. Okay. Uh, many people have argued that since uh, extension and intention are clearly different, you should actually separate those two measurements all the way. And that's actually what I tried in the first place. Okay. And later, I realized there not only impossible, also there are a lot of limitations. So I merged them together. Okay. Uh, but uh, later you will see at a la later layer, if it's really necessary to separate this from this, it can still be done. But in um, a little bit more complicated way. Okay. So anyway, that's this definition. Then given that, the amount of positive and negative evidence becomes straightforward. I actually already mentioned that. It's nothing but the cardinality of the sets. Right? You just count how many plus and minus are there. And, and accumulate them separately. You see that you add the extensional part and the intentional part together. That's the total positive evidence. This is the total negative evidence. This is the total evidence which is positive plus negative. So intuitively speaking, the total evidence is how many times you have checked this relation. Okay. Uh, you check it 100 times, maybe 80 times is positive, uh, 20 negative, something like that. And also you see in terms of uh, the scope of evidence, you see it's determined by the extension of the subject and the intention of the predicate. And some of you may already think, well, this one looks symmetric. Okay. So that whatever supports this, it seems also support this, which sounds probably wrong. Well, actually, that's right. Okay. Uh, positive evidence are symmetric, but negative evidence are not. Okay, that's another thing that have interesting uh, implication, uh, which we are going to uh, discuss in the future. By the way, how many of you here know uh, confirmation paradox or Humper's uh, Raven paradox? Okay, yeah, hopefully in the future we will talk about that. And that's actually here what I gave as a, a solution to that problem. Okay. Uh, I, I will explain that in the future, hopefully. So, okay, now a key definition, truth value. Truth value, I already said, it measures evidential support. So no surprise that the truth value of NARS is defined with respect to the amount of positive, negative, and the total evidence. But the first question is, well, it seems that since what you really need is evidential support measurement, okay? Uh, you already defined that. Why bother with something else? Uh, maybe this is already uh, enough for, your, for, 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 for the logic itself. Uh, yes and no. Theoretically speaking, yes, all the information are here. Okay? Uh, truth value later we'll see is nothing but a, a function of this. And this three number, of course, there are only two uh, degree of freedom because uh, this plus this equal to this, right? So among this three, uh, you can decide, you can use 
uh, any two of them, the third one will be uniquely defined. And also, of course, there is a, there is a restriction that uh, both of this uh, will be truth value. Well, here it looks like an integer, but in reality, it doesn't have to be integer. You can have half piece of uh, evidence, okay? Uh, and this one will be at least as big as uh, either of the two. And, uh, and one of them can be zero, okay? Uh, of course, uh, the whole thing can be zero. That, that corresponds to, I don't know. I have no information at all. Okay. Another common question at this point is that people may say, oh, this looks too simple. Evidence clearly is much more complicated than that, okay? You may have different evidence from different places. They may have different weight, and some of them may be more reliable, some of them may be wrong. That's completely correct. But I'm not going to take that into consideration in this stage. So once again, here we are talking about idealize the situation. You see here, the reality later we'll see. I'm using this language to define evidence for this language, okay? And this is the idealized thing. You, you never have it real, uh, in reality, but you can use it as a definition. So my excuse is think about how we define a unit in all the other fields. How do you define a meter or kilogram? Something like that. You see, if you check the definition, all of them are defined in a highly idealized situation. In reality, you never have that environment. But that definition gave you the basic unit. Okay? Then what you use in reality will become kind of like approximation of that idealized unit. Here, what I'm doing is exactly the same. Okay? So this is the definition. This is not how you decide the truth value. You don't really count the extension and intention. Okay? But that's how you understand what is measured. Okay? We're going to talk about that more in the future, but now I just, think, I just know that some of you are already thinking about that. Here is the truth value. No surprise, you see, to capture this information, first I want a relative measurement, okay? And this, you know, both of them is in this range. All right? That makes some sense, but in reality, this is pretty difficult to handle. Uh, we would rather want some measurement, uh, again, in this range. So what I'm doing is to map something from that to this. But again, given the situation that here you have two freedom, here if you want to keep all the information, you also need, you need two numbers. One number will not be enough, later we will see. Okay? So that's another thing that make my system different, is, is using kind of like two components or two dimensional truth value. It's not only a multi-valued logic. Is more than that. It used two numbers, okay? and both of them are between zero and one in this range. You see, the first number is trivial. Is what everyone will take. Okay, and I call it frequency. Is the proportion or ratio of positive evidence among all evidence. It just, as I said, I checked this. Uh, 100 times, 80 times is correct. So it's 80% of the time is correct, or it's 0 0.8, the, the success frequency of this relationship. Okay. Many people will say, some of you may say, oh, that's just probability. No, probability is what? That's probability, right? This, this is not. But very often to be taken as an approximation of probability. Later I'm going to argue that's not even an approximation of probability in my system. 
One reason I can mention now is this thing doesn't necessarily have a limit, OK? Not all ratio has a limit. It's not true. Some of them has. If you only have finite information, theoretically speaking, you have no idea whether there's that, that sequence will converge or not. Okay? Since I'm not making any assumption about the future, I don't even bother to, to check whether there's a limit or not. I will just use this number itself, which is always available. Okay? Or what is measured is the available information. Okay? So that, uh, so clearly, that's between zero and one. Zero means it's always false in the past. One means, well, so far, it's always true. Again, in the past. Uh, then 0.5 is in the middle, it's half and half. Okay? Very simple. The only uh, confusing part is it's not probability, even though it's intuitively related to it. Okay? And the second one, uh huh. There are evidence. I don't really handle it. Uh, later we'll see. Uh, it's defined as an uh, extreme case. Okay? If something has zero evidence, I don't even need to mention it, just because I don't have the space for the things that I have no idea at all. But I can provide that as an answer. You ask me a question, I say I have no idea. So that means zero evidence. Then directly related to that question is the second number is what I call confidence value, which is this. Okay. This is a total amount of evidence. This one is what I call a system parameter. It's a constant. It's, uh, actually, it's a positive constant for some reason later we'll explain it need to be larger than or equal to one. Uh, this is uh, uh, what I call, in this new book, I call it Evidential Horizon. Uh, also, it's one of the so-called system personality parameter. Okay. Uh, whatever I call personal uh, personality parameter are the numbers, there is, theoretically speaking, there is no optimum or correct value. Uh, value in a certain range may all work. For example, in this case, I have tried uh, to use k equal to 1, and k equal to 2, and both of them actually work reasonably well. Uh, but the system will have some systematic uh, difference in its behavior. Again, we're going to talk about that in the future. Okay? To make things simple in the following discussion, that's, by the way, that's the current default value uh, in the code, uh, equal to 1. First, let's think about what this number is about. Well. Intuitively speaking, it comes from a very in simple observation. That is, if you tried something, uh, it works once, but it fails once, and this f will be 0.5. And what if you tried it, it's successful for one, million times, and also fails another million times. F also is 0.5, right? right in the middle. But your belief, actually, is very different than this two scenario. The difference doesn't show up in your preference between a yes answer and no answer, because in both of the situations, you are right in the middle. You don't have a preference at all. But intuitively speaking, this one corresponds to a much more stable answer compared to this situation. This, is, this situation is pretty close to I don't know. I know a little bit, okay? This, I know a lot. So how to capture that thing? That's what this one is about. You'll see that, and this issue also have been raised before uh, in history, uh, some people say that actually shows the uncertainty within this number. 
Okay. In this case, this number is very uncertain. In this case, this number is itself is certain. So many people have tried to introduce, for example, second order probability. So that's the probability of a probability, okay? Uh, intuitively, I agree, but technically, that approach has all kinds of troubles. Okay. So I, indeed, I, I introduced this one, which is kind of like, this is a, we can still say this one is kind of like second order. In what sense, in the sense that this number is about the uncertainty of this, this statement. And this number, in a sense, is about the uncertainty in this number. Okay. How sure you are, it is 0.5. But it is not a probability. You see, at least we can see the extreme situation. Okay. If w equal to 0, c equal to 0, which is what, which is, I don't know. When W become bigger and bigger and bigger, this thing will converge to one, but it will never reach one because this is always bigger than this, right? By a little bit. Okay. So you can say I'm pretty, pretty, pretty sure there is always a chance your belief will be modified by future ex experience, no matter how sure you are. But indeed, there is a difference between this scenario and this scenario. So this one, I introduced this measurement, this formula a long time ago, but I have been keep thinking about how to explain it, okay, what it actually measures. Uh, second order, you, you see here you already see uh, why I don't think second order prob probability uh, interpretation is going to work. If this thing actually is a probability, then zero means what? Zero means the true probability of this statement is not the number you gave. Okay? You gave me 0.5, I say it's wrong, it's not 0.5. That, that's kind of like second order probability. But that's completely different from the actual interpretation. The actual interpretation is zero means I have no idea. I cannot say you're wrong if I have no idea. Okay? That's two different scenarios. So, but later I realized actually there is a relatively uh, natural interpretation because this measures what, this measures what do you know at the current moment. Actually, any positive number will work. Uh, later, but the later I will see, uh, we will see uh, uh, to make it bigger than one actually is necessary. So, but still, uh, Everything bigger than one or equal to one should work okay? under the current discussion. It gave you the, the idea about kind of like how much you already know. Okay? So you'll see that also this number actually in the current form actually converge. It converts to one because it mon monotonically increase over time, right? It's because with the coming of new experience, this number can always get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You always know more and more and more and more and more. Of course, in reality, there are more complicated situations. For example, later you realize some of the previous evidence actually is completely garbage. It's, it shouldn't be counted at all. Or you, you forget some of them. Well, we are going to handle that in the future. But they are taken into consideration. Okay? For now, we just concentrate on, again, uh, idealize the situation. Say this one will go up, so this one will go up, and it will eventually convert to one. But on the other hand, this one, whether you really believe it or don't believe it, it doesn't necessarily convert to anything. Okay. So that's not a probability. This thing converts to one, but also is not probability. It's especially, it's not the probabi probability for this to be correct. Okay, it's a reliability in a sense. So,
Yeah, I have a bunch of discussion about you know how it's related, especially to probability theory. I actually have several paper uh, just to discuss the uh, relationship of my uncertainty measurement with probability theory. And furthermore, uh, in the coming AGI annual conference, we have a workshop just debate about this thing again. Yeah. So if you are interested, you can wait until that time to, to listen to more argument from me. And then just quickly, quickly summarize the situation. Uh, first, I actually, I introduced a third interpretation or representation of uncertainty. Why is the third? I already said the uncertainty can be represented by any two of these three numbers. Okay? Or it can be equally represented by the pair of frequency and confidence. And then I introduce another thing, call it the frequency interval. Because also there are several uh, uncertainty measurements which also try to extend the probability. They say probability is too strong. Not only you, you don't know whether that thing happened or not, okay? You also, you don't know its probability. You can only estimate it in a certain interval. Okay, you can say it's between 0 0.6 and 0 0.8, okay? But you don't really know whether it's 0 0.7 or 0.75. So to compare my approach with those approach, I also gave this interpretation. But this interpretation is different from theirs. This is, again, is not a probability interval. It's a frequency interval. Again, it's defined in the near future. That is, if the current number is this, where it can be until this amount of new thing come? Well, we know for sure, just uh, no matter what will happen in the future, okay, just from according to the current information, we know for sure it will be here. Think about it, it's obvious. If all new information are negative, the total amount increase, the positive amount remain the same. If the total, uh, if all the new information are positive, then both of them are increased by the same amount. Everything else will be in between. Okay. And then here I give you a summary. And also this one have an interesting property that is, you can use the width of the interval to measure your level or degree of ignorance, how much you don't know. If the interval is pretty wide, it just basically means my belief can be anywhere, okay? That means you don't really know much. If it's pretty narrow, uh, once again, it shows that I'm not going to change my belief too much on this. Um, and if you take the simple calculation, you'll see the width of the interval is nothing but this, which is nothing but this. Okay, so ignorance, confidence, are exactly the opposite of each other. Okay, when this one converts to one, this one will convert to zero. If this one is roughly one, this one will be roughly zero. Okay, it's consistent with our ordinary usage of those notions. So, in summary, uh, this one also gave me the, uh, the foundation for, for example, some people still say, oh, it's too complicated. In our natural language, when we talk about things, we don't use number at all, not to mention two numbers, okay? And no one says things in that way. Yes, I know that. But there is a reason for me to use two numbers within the system. But I don't insist the computer have to always use these two numbers when it communicates with the outside world. Actually, the current implementation take a default value, and also we allow natural language description. Say, I think this thing is possibly true, or I guess this is the case, or I'm pretty sure this is the case. Okay? Uh, all those things can be first mapped into some kind of interval, then mapped into the internal representation. But one thing I know 
I believe strongly. That is, the internal representation of uncertainty need to have a higher accuracy compared to the representation in the communication. Very often they have this scenario, say, I ask you, you know, there's two options for a certain situation. Is A likely to be the case? You, you say, yeah, I think so. I think it's possible. And how about B? You also say, yeah, it's also possible. You see in the level of uh, language, natural language description, they kind of like the same. But they ask you, which one is more likely? Sometimes you can tell me A is more likely than B, which indicate that within your mind, you have a higher accuracy. Okay? Then you usually uh, use uh, in your natural language representation. And also that thing actually later you will see is absolutely necessary. Okay? So in natural language interface, just one minute, I allow a lower accuracy, but within the system, I insist to use two numbers. Could it be useful to have K be related to the term or statement that it's related to? Because I can imagine that you have different... Context. Uh, yes, and then for one, you get a lot of uh, evidence all the time, mm -hmm. um, and for the other one you don't. So the one you, that you get a lot of evidence for, uh, you will have a very narrow um, frequency in the yeah. call, yeah. but it doesn't really mean you are more confident because you will get a lot more evidence all the time. So I can imagine that it might be useful to relate K to the rate at which information comes in for them. Uh, in, in principle, I agree with you. It's just that currently I'm not, the system currently is not that complicated. But in principle, yes. When the system be able to recognize, for example, recognize also information source, mm -hmm. also make a difference. Yes. Okay. Some information source give you more accurate things. Some other things, you know, some guy, even though that guy say, I'm pretty sure you don't believe him. Okay. Uh, that kind of thing can be handled at a, a higher layer by adding some more additional uh, control mechanism in, into into the numbers. But, but for now, it is this way. And their, their relations, you see, they're summarized in this way. Uh, and, uh, and also, the normal situation, as I said, in reality, when you actually try the system, you will see that uh, this one, even though in theory is in this range, okay, both frequency and confidence can be between the R1. In the implementation, actually is this. Okay, it cannot reach one. It reach one means absolute truth, which I don't allow at the fundamental level for the reason I explained. And also, I don't allow, I don't know, because I don't know it's a waste of space, okay? You don't remember them. Uh, so that's the normal situation. But I still keep the other two situations as extreme situation to be used in the meta-level discussion, okay? Uh, which correspond to you know c equal to zero and one or i equal to zero and one and or w go to infinite things like that and then this table nicely summarized uh, the relationship uh, among these three representations so theoretically speaking uh, you can use any of the three within the system okay because all the other things are uniquely determined from uh, from any of the representation, but uh, in reality, to make things simple and to be for for engineering consideration, I actually use this. Okay? I leave the other two in the discussion. Say, if you give me some interval data, I can uh, interpret it in this way. Then use the the mapping to translate it into this, or the other way around. You, if you tell me, you know, I tried this five times. Uh, four times is right, one time is wrong, then you're giving me information in this form. And then I will, I will convert them into this and remember it in the system in that way. Okay. Then, now the new grammar. The new grammar you'll see, it looks a little bit complicated, but actually is the same as the old grammar of this. The only difference is now you need to attach a truth value into a statement, okay? A truth value will, is defined in this way, and is understood in, in all the three ways, and they should be equivalent to each other. 
So, but now you see that, that's what I said. I use this one to define this one. Why? Because I kind of, in the previous discussion, I still assume evidence itself is either completely yes or no. I just count them, okay? Uh, and then I get this number. It's a matter of degree. But in reality, of course, you don't have idealized evidence for you to count. So the reality is, or the input itself, or the actual experience, is nothing but a sequence of statement with the truth value itself. Okay? So the input information already have a different label attached to it to indicate how strong or how you know, true it is. Well, if that's the case, why bother to use this idealized version? Why not directly do this using actual experience? You cannot, because that's a circular definition. Okay? You're using the truth value of the premise to define the truth value of the conclusion, then you need to explain where the number come from in the first place. So what I'm doing, as I said, just like in physics and many other domains, I define evidence in an idealized situation and use that definition to define truth value. But then what? Then I will know that if you give me a statement with a truth value, for example, something like this, then I will say, this one is as true as I have tested nine times uh, in idealized situation, and they're always correct. Even though in reality, I have tried 12 times in last idealized situation. Okay? So we're using this kind of like as an idealized unit to measure your degree of belief. Okay? So that's the key difference between uh, Actual and idealized experience. The actual experience are the one that is actually used in the system uh, to, to do reasoning. Okay? This, uh, this discussion about that. Uh huh. Uh, yes and no. The yes part is kind of like if I say at a certain moment, okay, I talk about the belief, then this definition allow me to say, okay, I believe this as strong as I have some kind of axioms, right, from them, uh, it supports to this degree. But the no part is I never really have those axioms. What I have are other experience, but I'm using that experience uh, axioms to measure how strong the foundation is. Okay? And then after the break, we will talk about actually the inference rules, which will actually provide uh, those calculations about uh, evidential support. Okay? But all of the inference rules need to be justified against this foundation. That is what your number means. Okay? You need to tell me that. Okay? This is what the number means. But it doesn't mean you actually get that in that way. That's, a, that's two related but different story. Okay, again, let's take a break to 10.15. Uh, we actually already finished uh, two major components among the three okay, uh, uh, for our logic. We have defined the language. It's a very simple language. Uh, it's just a subject and predicate related by a, a copular Inheritance copular, then followed by a pair of uh, real number between zero and one. Okay, so uh, every sentence is something like this. Except, of course, there are also questions. The question is nothing but a sentence without the truth value, right? So the system is supposed to find the truth value for that question. And also, in some question, subject or predicate can be a variable to be instantiated. So it's a what. Is a P or something like that, right? But after all, something like that provide 
that's how the language is, is defined in this very simple logic. And also, intuitively speaking, using graphical representation, uh, you see it's nothing. Now we say it's a directed weighted graph, right? So now we have a lot of nodes, each one corresponds to a term, and then there are links in between. Uh, whether there's a circles, it, it doesn't matter for now. Okay? Uh, and also, furthermore, each link is attached with two numbers to indicate the truth value. So the system's knowledge at any moment is nothing but this kind of graph. At least that's the case at this level. Okay? But la later you will see it's not that simple. So far it's okay. We can use that as an intuitive representation uh, about the system's knowledge. Uh, then what's the new input you see? Uh, wh when the system gets a new input at the current stage, we just think, okay, you tell me something else uh, between this one and this one. Uh, and uh, so that means I can build a new edge okay, between them. Or maybe some of the term you never mentioned before, that will also introduce a new term, uh, which related to something else, okay, with, with a certain truth value. Uh, so that new input will become a different way to add nodes and links with truth value to this graph. Okay. Then what is the inference? Inference is kind of like using the existing links to make new links if we represent I still talk in, in, in graph uh, theory uh, terminology. Okay? But of course, now the uh, inference rules are more complicated than before. It's not just transitivity anymore. So we're going to introduce several uh, different inference rules. And especially, you see, now the inference rules also need to handle the truth value. Okay? Everything is true to a degree, so if you derive uh, from this tool, you derive this, and also this should be a matter of degree, and this degree clearly depends on this degree and this degree, as well as how these two are combined to each other or related to each other. Okay? So that's, make, uh, that's what makes the inference world more complicated. So uh, roughly speaking, there are three groups of rules. One is called the local rules. Okay? Uh, which basically doesn't really change the graph, but using the existing rule for something, in a sense. Okay. And then we have forward inference rule, which derive new belief from given belief. And we ho also have backward inference rule, which derive new questions from given question uh, and uh, existing belief. So we're starting with the, the local rules. First one, revision. Okay. Revision rule, uh, in terms of format, it looks like this. That is, for the same statement, what if I have two different opinions? First, how is that possible? You see, in a sense, this corresponds to what? To an inconsistency. Okay? What makes this one different from probability-based approach? Not only is because of, you know, I don't take a limit, but also because I don't assume for any given statement there can be only one number attached to it. But according to the axioms of probability theory, that's the definition, okay. You can say the probability, I don't know it yet. But you, you cannot validly say there are two different numbers. One is 0.5, one is 0.6. Both of them can be attached to that thing. It doesn't make sense. Okay. But why in this situation uh, it makes sense? Because, again, the semantics. What this one measures is the relation, as I said, between this and the chunk of evidence, which is not mentioned. It's implied, right? But it's there somewhere. So if this one actually measures the relationship between this and the evidence, then for the same statement, for different evidence, of course the truth value will be different. Okay? 
so that you may you know uh, collect some inform uh, information which all support a certain statement. Uh, but uh, later in a different scenario, you collect other information which all uh, against the statement. Okay, so that in the first case you're going to have uh, a one here, and the second case you have a zero here with some uh, some kind of corresponding confidence value, which is quite normal. Uh, so that's a contradiction. So it's a normal thing because because this come and this come from different sources. Uh, which happen all the time for us. Okay. Also, very often the, the situation is not that extreme. That is, these two numbers doesn't have to be the opposite of each other. And this may be, say, 0 0.9, this is 0 0.6, but there's still an inconsistency. Okay. But once again, this can be justified because you're collecting information. Uh, well, if we are using a traditional statistical uh, Terminology is kind of like you try to pull uh, two sample, merge two sample space or something like that together. Okay? Uh, sometimes people use, uh, call it uh, data fusion or something like that. But anyway, in this model, we do have that scenario. So if that's the case, then what the system will do? Actually, pretty simple. As far as you know, this one and this one indeed come from different sources. Okay, how do we know that? Well, later we will explain that. It just for now, we just assume that's the case. Okay. Then what? Then it's pretty simple. According to our previous definition, you see the amount of evidence can be simply added together. Okay. So this one, you see, is kind of like this number actually means you have checked this, uh, this thing 10 times and in nine of them, it's true, okay? This one actually means uh, you have tested five times and in three of them is true. Then altogether what? You test this thing 15 times and in 12 of them is true, right? Uh, so, so that you directly get the conclusion in that way. So that's what we call uh, revision rule. So the, the, the necessary, uh, why this is, uh, we don't assume one statement, one number, that kind of uh, consistency. Okay. We allow different numbers, but it doesn't mean we are not going to do anything. We are going to merge them using this rule. So it's a, uh, a special case of this is uh, contradiction handling, but it's not necessary only about that. So, even if these two numbers are the same, say both of them are positive, this rule still makes sense. Because what? Because it's an accumulation of evidence of the same nature from different sources. You accumulate them together, then the conclusion of course this will still be one. But this one will always be bigger than this and this, right? Because this is a summarized evidence. So, if you check the formula of the truth value, a form of uh, amount of evidence, it's just uh, the two separate things add together. Uh, but uh, if you represent that as a true value functions, if you represent the, the, as uh, functions between f and c, okay, uh, actually it looks very complicated. Okay? Uh, but uh, it's still, it's just directly derived from uh, that addition plus the relationship uh, I showed you in the previous table between amount of evidence and truth value. Okay, you can derive that by yourself, just. Uh, but if you check it in this format, still it makes sense. You will see that this F is nothing but a weighted average of this F1 and F2, okay? It's just the weight itself is not just this two number, it's some kind of function of them, which corresponds to the intuition that if you have a confliction, the result is always a compromise, but not necessarily right in the middle. It will be closer to the premise where the confidence level is higher, okay? If you have more positive than negative, then the, 
then what you are going to believe at the end it will be closer to the positive side. But not as extreme as this because you also need to take the other one into consideration, more or less. On the other hand, this number is always larger than both of them. Unless, unless of course, one of them is zero, and then this one will be the same as this. Okay? But we don't allow that to happen. Uh, zero confidence, you know, it's just a waste of resource. Okay? So, in reality, this one is always higher than both of them. And that is how a system begins to have a stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger belief on a certain topic. Because, because it's collecting evidence from different sources and combine them together. So the really tricky part for this rule is not the truth value function. Is how do you know these two things are based on no overlapping evidence? Okay? What if this one is based on this chunk of evidence and this one is based on this chunk of evidence. Then if you're using the same rule, you're going to count this part twice. Clearly, that's wrong. Okay? Uh, especially, the, the especially wrong situation is, what if this one and this one are actually two copies of the same input? Then you're making yourself stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. Okay? Clearly, that's, that's invalid. So, when we talk about control mechanism, I will say more about that. Uh, for now, I will just tell you roughly uh, what the system does is a highly uh, uh, simplified solution. Okay? That is, if this is the case, mathematicians will say, oh, in that situation, you will have to use you know, this, this, Add together, but minus the no overlap. Okay. Um, yeah, ideally that's the case, but in reality you cannot really do that. Okay. Uh, because because evidence is not a simple set in this calculation anymore. It's much more complicated. Okay. Just to decide how much a certain piece contributes to the overall evidence uh, to the overall truth value. Uh, it's a very complicated process. So what I did is this. If I realize this two are based on overlapping evidence, I don't apply the rule at all. So the rule is applied only when this E1 and E2 have nothing to do with each other. Which also means, you see, the system need to have a way to remember the, the body of evidence that from which this truth value is derived. Yes and no. Okay, the yes part is yes, you have to remember it. Uh, not only for this rule, later you will see there are a couple of other rules. You have to remember where each belief comes from. On the other hand, you cannot completely remember that because they actually demand complete information which I rule out at the very beginning, and also resource. Okay? One step, two steps is okay, because if the system actually lives many years, and then each believer actually may have a very complicated you know, family tree, where it come from, it, there's no way for you to remember all of them. Just like us. Okay? You have a belief, I ask you, where does that come from? Sometimes you can give me some, some kind of reason, okay? But very often, that's not really the complete story. And you don't even remember the complete story by yourself. Okay? So because of that kind of uh, consideration, uh, the system have a partial record about where each of the, uh, each of the truth value come from. Uh, I will check that partial record, uh, record to decide whether that rule will be applied or not. Okay? So, if it's not the case, then what? Then the system will keep both of them. Okay? But remember, they, they come from different places. What if the system have to make a selection? Uh, say that, for example, you have indeed have a 0 0.9, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.10, 0 0.11, 0 0.12, 0 0.13, 0 0.14, 0 0.15, 0 0.16, 0 0.17
for one, and this is a point eight and point seven. Okay, but they are overlapping evidence so that you cannot really combine them together. Well, what I do is I just pick one of them. Which one? That's determined by the choice rule. That's a separate rule. Okay. The choice rule in this case is straightforward. I will just pick this one. Why? Because this number is bigger than this number. You may say, oh, this number is also bigger than this. That one doesn't count for this case. Okay? Because, because this number indicates which one has a higher evidential support, or which one is supported by more evidence. Whenever there is a confliction, and this confliction cannot be resolved by merge the two, uh, adaptive system should pick the one with more evidence behind it no matter what is the frequency value. Okay. So, pretty simple. But another word, uh, application of a choice rule is more complicated. That is, the confliction is not between those two anymore. It's not a contradiction anymore. It's this. The two subjects, they are not actually about the same term. They are two different terms. But the predicate are the same. Okay? It's kind of like you say, rabbit is a type of bird and penguin is a type of bird. But uh, people say, why bother with that? Because they, they don't conflict with each other. They are talking about different things. Yes, but they compete to what to be the answer of this question. Previously, we say that the system can handle yes, no question. That is, I give you a statement, you give me the truth value. In this case, the truth value is a multi-value, right? So I may ask the system this. If that's the case, then basically you see this choice rule actually uh, serving the role of the previous matching rule. It just pick an answer for a given question. If this is the question, okay, and these two are the answer where both of them is about S. I already said you pick the one with higher, higher confidence value. Ignore this. Okay, if this is more evidence than whatever this one said, okay, it's better justified than the other guy. But if it's a what question, then what you are, you're facing is kind of like, as I said, I'm looking for a bird, or I'm looking for a a term in the extension of a bird, accurately speaking, okay? And you know two of them. Not like in the previous binary logic. In binary logic, I already said, if you have more than one conclusion, both uh, all of them are equally good. But here is a matter of degree. Clearly, you need to pick one. And as I said, this is Robin, this is uh, Penguin, okay? And what is a good answer? Well, theoretically speaking, the best answer to this question will be provided by something of this truth value. Okay? Absolutely true. But you know that's impossible. Okay? This is impossible. So that, uh, so you, you, you say, uh, if I only talk about uh, allow two uh, digits after this one point, then you're looking for something like that, uh, but you don't have that. Okay, then you will have to say which one is closer to that. Well, this one have a higher frequency, but this one have a higher confidence. In this case, both of them matters. Okay, think about it. You're looking for a, a good example of a bird, and this one is good in the sense that uh, it's a higher percent of evidence supported. And this one is good in the sense that they have more evidence. Uh, which one is better? Well, this is a place where you need a formula to actually combine those two numbers into one so you can compare them. Okay? Uh, and also there is a long story behind this formula, and this formula has very interesting property, but we don't have the time to talk about that. I will just show you the result. 
this is what I call expectation value. Uh, this value uh, I represent it in all three formats, okay, because they are all interesting for different reasons. Uh, the expectation value, you see, if you use uh, the frequency interval representation, then this is nothing but the expectation. It's the middle point of that interval. Okay. It's kind of like say, you know your future uh, belief will be in this interval, and since you are open to all possibility, then if you have to pick a value, you pick the middle point. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, then the real one implemented in the code, of course, is the truth value version. Okay. Uh, so the intuition is something like this. You are using, uh, why is code expectation? It's kind of like, intuitively speaking, uh, even though this truth value is a record about the past, the expectation is a prediction about the future. Okay. And which one is more likely to be confirmed next time? So you're going to use this one as the approximation, and this one tell you how close it will be to, to, to that number. Okay. Uh, why? Because you can see this one can be rewrite into this format, which may make it more clear. Or we use 0.5. Why 0.5 is important? 0.5 means no preference, the middle point. Okay. Uh, or if we put it in the, another way, that's this formula. If you are absolutely sure about this thing, then you'll have this, which means uh, you use frequency as expectation. Your past and the future will be the same if you are pretty sure about that. Okay? In reality, of course, it's not. So that in reality, your frequency, uh, your expectation is always more conservative than your frequency value. Conservative means closer to the middle point. Okay? So if this is 0.5, if your f is here, your e will be here. On the other hand, also, if f is here, your e will be here. It's closer to the, I don't know, point, or I don't have a preference. Okay? So intuitively, that's what that means. Um, also, this one, the intuition is harder to, to get, but this one has special interest if you are familiar with the history of uh, inductive logic. This one, the same formula have been derived by different people uh, under different interpretation. So anyway, we don't want to talk more about that. And uh, I mentioned that this is related to uh, Laplace's uh, rule of succession and to lambda continuum of Carnap and so on. Uh, also, this one show you uh, the selection of K will actually make a difference between different systems. Uh, intuitively speaking, uh, different k will decide, you know, the relative power of these two factor in the final result, uh, in, in the expectation uh, calculation, which once again we are going to skip. So that's the two special local rule. Okay? You see, once again, uh, revision rule means how to accumulate evidence on the same statement. Uh, choice rule means how to pick uh, among competing one uh, to answer a question. Okay? They don't really derive any new relationship. And the one that really derives things, uh, new things are the forward inference rules. Or that's kind of like the normal or the most typical inference rules. Which overall in this system have the format of that triangle I, I, I drawn before, okay? 
So you have some kind of relation between m and p to a certain degree. And you also have some relation between s and m to a certain degree. And now using m as the middle term, using Aristotle's terminology, we are going to be able to build some relation between s and p, which is true to a certain degree. But now it's not that simple because, because the direction may go either this way or this way, and the direction may go either this way or this way. And actually, the conclusion, you also have the scenario. Okay, because, well, you see, it's kind of symmetric. So in the following, we are going to introduce four different uh, forward inference rules, corresponding to different combination. Okay. Uh, so this is just a different format talking about the same thing. And one of the biggest uh, problem, which is still a controversy until today, is what's the theoretical foundation of this calculation? Okay. Many people, uh, or maybe I should not say many people, but several people in the past have kind of liked my basic idea about this kind of logic. Okay? But they think they can somehow figure out a way to use the probability theory to do that calculation. Uh, actually, I thought that myself at the very beginning. I tried to use probability theory several, for several years, and later I gave up. It's, uh, because of the reason I mentioned before, not only they are not probability, for the more, well, everyone agrees they're not a typical uh, probability. It's just many people think, even though they're not probability, they can be approximately taken to be probability. Okay, my conclusion now is stronger than that. It's not even approximately probability. It's something else. Okay. But it's related to probability theory, for sure. Yes, yes. Okay. So after... Uh, working on this for several years. Now this is the result I settled down with. That is, I take this, all of them, as some kind of like extended Boolean value. Once again, you see Boolean value of this, right? And both of them are this, okay? Uh, and also several other parameters also are in this range. So I take this, well, of course, confidence cannot take that extreme value, but it doesn't really matter for this discussion. We, I take that as a limit, extreme. Okay? So basically, now the idea, I, I stipulate my truth value function is to start here. Just like, you see, I start from this logic and to do this logic. Here, I'm doing exactly the same thing. First, I think about what is the valid inference in binary situation. Okay. As soon as I get that, I get what? I get a boundary condition for the actual truth value function, which will fill in the middle thing by doing what? By extending the Boolean operator. What's the Boolean operator? Well, not an, an or, right? They are defined by truth table in the binary logic. And now I extend that. And also this actually not completely my work. And this kind of thing have been discussed in the literature, especially in the literature of fuzzy logic for many years. Okay? They have the same need. They need to provide the justification of their calculation. Then they think it can be handled as extended uh, Boolean operator. Okay. So, uh, so the terminology they use is called the triangle norm and triangle core norm for this guy and this guy. Okay. They want the boundary situation to satisfy the truth table, uh, but they want to fill in the middle. And there are several different choices. Actually, at the very beginning, you know, uh, fuzzy logic take a minimum for that, a maximum for that. Okay. But that choice caused a whole, 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 whole bunch of trouble. And, uh, and then many people suggest something else. 
like for example, this is the pair I'm using, which are actually very similar to probability under the assumption of conditional independence of the numbers involved. Okay. So that's as I said, there are some similarity between this and the probability, but it's not justified according to probability theory. So that's this, okay? Uh, and it just means multiply them all together, or it's a little bit more complicated, okay? But uh, roughly speaking, the simplicity situation uh, is nothing but Just like in probability, you know, if you have one number on this dimension, we one, you have another number on this dimension, we two, and then a one or we two will be what? Will be this area plus this area and minus the overlapping part. You don't want to count it twice. On the other hand, we want and we two will be exactly the overlapping part. Okay, that's the product of those two numbers. That's the intuitive meaning of this formula. This formula just extended into a situation where you have more than two arguments involved. Okay, but the idea remains the same. It's just more than two dimension. Okay. So, so short story, that's how I build my truth value function. Okay. So in the following, I will quickly go through the major truth value function and show you how the truth value, of, uh, the numbers are actually up to 10. So-called basic stylogastic rules, which it's basically correspond to exactly this. Okay. So, uh, what I'm doing is I don't really think about all possible. You see, here you have two choices. Here you have two choices. Here you have two choices. Exactly speaking, you have eight different combinations. Okay? But to simplify the situation, I only talk about this one. The other way around, you just switch these two letters. Okay? So if that's the case, then you have four different, uh, you have four different combinations. And that's exactly what that table shows you. Okay? So, you see, the first premise is between M and P in both ways. The second one is between S and M, also in both ways. And for the conclusion, you see the first row, I only think about from S to, M, to, M, to P. Okay, so that gave you one table, and then, then uh, you can talk about the other way around, okay, which is symmetric to the previous one. It's just which is S, which is P, which is the first premise, which is the second. This should not matter too much. So I'm going to concentrate on the first, give you the four combination. And uh, each of them, you see, is going to take, uh, I use uh, subscript one for the first premise, two for the second one, and uh, for the result, I will just use f and c as provided by a function. And that function comes with a name, which is the name which name the type of inference. As you can guess, this is deduction. This is abduction. This is induction. Okay, this is what I call explification, which I will explain later. So let's start with the simplest situation, deduction. Deduction is what is this? Okay, also following the convention use in Aristotle's logic, okay, uh, I always name the, the one that contains the predicate of the conclusion as the first premise or the major premise. Okay? And the one other one which contains the subject of the conclusion is the minor or second premise. That, that's the convention followed in the system. Okay? And this tool, calculated by that function. So that function, actually, actually speaking, are two formulas. It's a pair of formulas. Okay? One of them will give you this, the other one give you this. But altogether, I call it a function. Okay. okay, what is this? This, you see, actually, this one is nothing but the transitivity, right? 
the only inference rule based on transitivity in this logic. I will just expand that from binary to multi-value also two-dimensional. But still, that rule provide what? The boundary condition. Okay. So how to do the mapping between this one and this one? You see that this one, I said, this truth value never reach one, but I can take one as the limit, right? So this truth value, theoretically speaking, correspond to the binary true in this model, right? So this model provide a limit case for this model. But now you see the one reason why, why I define that one first. Okay. Which give you what? Which give you the following Boolean operation, a Boolean relationship. Okay. First, let's think about it in binary term. What if it just zero and one? In what situation you can say this is true? Well, it need to be both this one and this one to be true. Both of them. Okay? So f equal to n f1, f2. And also I have after some analyze, I reached the conclusion that f value of the conclusion only depends on the f value of the premise. On the other hand, the c value of the conclusion depends on all of them. Later we will see why. Okay. So in this case, clearly this should be the end of the tool if it have to be represented as a Boolean function. And by the way, it's possible to have more than one Boolean function established. If that's the case, I will just pick the simplest one. Okay. Because in a sense, or as far as accuracy is not a big deal, they're not that far from each other. In what situation you are absolutely sure about the conclusion. Well, in reality, you know you're never, but I will take that as a limit, okay? In what situation you're very close to absolutely sure. Then clearly, both this one and this one need to be close to absolutely sure, okay? Furthermore, this one and this one need to, clo to be close to positive. If I know this is not a type of P, this is not a type of M, even though I'm pretty sure about them, you basically don't know anything about this relation. Because, because of transitivity, in a sense, like only goes through positive um, evidence. Okay? Negative evidence in this case, a strong negative evidence in any of the two primates basically break this chance. And, and which say that you cannot really derive anything from them. Okay? So because, well, of course this is a simplified description, but because of this kind of analysis, first you get a Boolean relationship, and then it's pretty straightforward to turn that Boolean relationship into a real number function just because you see, as I said, and it's just a multiplication. Okay. Then it will move from here actually to, to here, and that's where the truth value function comes from for deduction, okay. which is summarized later in the book. So it's just basically frequency is this two numbers multiplied, confidence is all the four numbers multiplied to each other. That's not too difficult. It seems a bit counterintuitive that if you have some positive evidence for two statements, let's say 0.7, and then the conclusion will be uh, 0.49, so it will yes. be negative. It will be negative, yes. Uh, but uh, whenever that happens, it's not too uh, counterintuitive because first, also, you'll see the confidence level of that kind of thing will be pretty low because there are four numbers multiply together, and uh, also confidence value. Uh, you know, already you have a low numbers between here and also there. And uh, also, if we analyze in this kind of situation, 
uh, we can actually make a case, say that even if both of them are positive, and when both of them who happen together, uh, I can say that's less than half of the chance. So that's, there is a possible justification for and that. In a similar way for the confidence value, if you are very sure that two things are not the case, then mm -hmm. the frequencies will be close to zero, and then the confidence value will also be close to zero. Yes. Yes, that's a very good point. At the very beginning, I'm confused in this case. If you see, basically what this formula says, just for deduction, if you're using this rule, you can only get strong positive conclusion. Where are the negative conclusions come from in the first place by deduction? Uh, I tried to combine that into this picture. I tried some other uh, truth value function, uh, different justification. Uh, the problem there are even bigger. So I now I kind of like settle down with in the first layer, I only provide positive conclusion, uh, but that negative conclusion thing, I will handle it later, uh, higher level, so that for the system as a whole, it's not really a loss of power. Yes, the system can strongly believe something will not happen, but not using this rule. Okay, later we, we will see that part. So, yeah, induction rule, yeah, it, it troubled me uh, for, for a while for, basically for the negative conclusion part. Uh, but the, the, that's relatively easier to be accepted okay, compared to the induction rule. This is where really uh, the controversial part of the logic. First, the format. What is induction? Well, induction intuitively corresponds to uh, generalization, okay, how to summarize your experience into general representation, but the accurate form in different logic are actually different from each other. Especially the form of induction in a predicate calculus or a predicate logic and uh, induction in term logic are very different, okay? In term logic, induction have actually uh, you see that in, in a certain related format, not exactly like this, but a similar format in Aristotle's work. Um, and later is uh, C.S. Peirce. Who first introduced uh, the definition of induction and abduction in term logic in, in the format I'm using. Okay. Uh, but of course, uh, Actually, I learned this about his work uh, at a later time. At the very beginning, actually, I tried to do this thing in sense theory. Okay. Uh, later, I use uh, Peirce uh, terminology. But anyway, no matter where it comes from, you see the pattern is this. The shared term are the common subject. And then the relation will be built between the predicate. Well, clearly, there is a, a symmetric relation uh, the other way around, okay, which is also covered in the table. Uh, here, the, the situation is this. Let's say, uh, let's use the, the, the typical example I use in my talks, uh, again, about the birds. Okay. Um, let's say, swan can swim. Since I only use uh, nouns in... in, in in the first layer, I just say swan is a kind of swimmer. And also, is a kind of bird. Then the conclusion will be bird swim. Or birds are swimmers. Okay, again, let's forget about the singular plural that over tense all the details in linguistics, okay? If you check a, a textbook in logic, every book will tell you this is a typical fallacy, okay? It's called overgeneralization. Uh, what you see is one case or one special type, uh, instance of, of a certain type, uh, which has a certain property. How can you generalize to the whole class? Uh, that is invalid, okay? 
Uh, many people have spent many years in inductive logic, and there, there are all kinds of troubles in, in their conclusion. Not to mention, in this case, the situation is even, even more complicated because the premise also comes with a truth value attached. So what is my solution? Actually, this one directly comes from the previous definition of what of evidence. You see, number one uh, thing that makes this uh, logic can do induction and can give it justification is actually because of the semantics. You see, accurately speaking, what this one measures is not about how many birds in the world can actually swim. I don't know that. The system doesn't know that. It's evidential support. That's why I keep stressing what it measures is not the distance between this one and the reality, but how much evidence the system has accumulated to support it. And where is the evidence? For all inference rules, the evidence is nothing but the information provided by the premise. What does that mean? That means in this rule, when you apply this rule, you basically assume you know nothing at all about this and this, except what is provided here. Okay. So if this is your only knowledge about this term, this term, and this term, what do you can say about that, about that relation? Well, once again, we start with the extreme situation. What if all those things are Boolean? Okay. Then it will reduce it to the scenario of this logic we should say this, you see. We are talking about whether birds are swimmers. And uh, we are doing collecting information by comparing their extension and intention of this tool. And in this case, clearly, what we have as extension. Okay? So we know the truth value of this and this. And again, we assume binary situation. According to the previous definition, if this is true, this is also true, this is positive evidence, right? That's how evidence is defined. One piece of positive evidence. If this is true, this is false. That's one piece of negative evidence. That is, as far as Swan is concerned, okay, whether this is true or not. Then what? Then that directly gave us this. So you see that W plus and W minus in general is just real numbers between zero and the infinite, right? But here we are talking about it most as one piece. So if that's the case, then once again, for this rule, this two number will be in the interval between zero and one. So they can be handled as extended Boolean value. Okay. Yes, uh, but uh, I don't use two directed. I kind of like apply this rule twice. One in this order, one in the other order. But in this case, uh, but uh, for this rule, uh, it is uh, the same in both... Uh, yes and no. Yes. Later you'll see. Uh, you see, uh, if you check the table, you'll see that indeed, uh, these two things are produced all together, okay? Uh, whether they are the same or not, let's check the the formula. You see, yes, positive evidence 
is symmetric. Negative, no. Okay. The negative evidence for this direction have nothing to do with the uh, with the other direction. But do we count uh, negative uh, negative evidence? Yes, we we do. You see. No, 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 now this arrowhead shows both. But the positive evidence uh, is, uh, is the one that agree with the direction. Negative is uh, kind of against this direction, but it is still defined with respect to this direction. Okay, the opposite direction is a different story, but a related story, because positive evidence are shared, but negative are not. But at least now we know that according to the previous definition, if I'm completely sure about this, that is, if this one is 1, 1, this is also 1, 1. What I get for this is one piece of positive evidence. You see here, the trick is I'm mixing the two representations of truth value, okay? Here I'm using true, uh, frequency and confidence. Here I'm using W. But the W can be converted into frequency and confidence uh, given their relationship. Okay. But the direct relation, uh, the direct conclusion is this. Okay. So if I have one one here, one one here, then I have W equal to W plus equal to one. That is, so one provide a perfect piece of evidence for the conclusion that birds swim. On the other hand, that's what this formula means. Okay. On the other hand, if all of them are still one, but this is zero, you see, this still need to be one. I'm sure it's not the case. If this one is zero, then you don't have evidence. It just means you don't know whether swans swim or not. It doesn't provide anything, okay? You need to know it does not swim for this to be negative evidence. So that gives you this. Once again, you replace and with multiplication, not, which I didn't mention, but it's just one minus, right? That's always uh, how you handle not in multivalue logic, no matter which, which system you use. Uh, then you get the truth value function, eventually used for this one, which is, Mm -hmm. uh, shouldn't uh, W plus plus uh, W minus uh, W positive plus W negative uh -huh. uh, be equivalent to W? Yes. It just in this case W minus equal to zero. Uh, but in those. Uh, uh, in the other situation, you have W equal to W minus equal to one and W plus equal to zero. In, in a binary situation. In formulas for I can't. Yeah, you see here, the most important thing is to remember that I'm not talking about in the world whether all birds can swim. Also, I'm not talking about the probability for birds to swim in the world. Instead, I'm talking about according to what you tell me right now, how much I can believe the conclusion. Okay, that's what the truth value means by definition. So that's kind of like the most important part uh, of this uh, truth value function set. Okay, uh, that is, I try to solve the problem of induction 
by using a new semantic theory, meaning that I'm not talking about the world anymore. I'm talking about evidential support. Okay. Using that, we can avoid overgeneralization because you see, in a sense, I'm not really saying more than what you tell me. I'm representing it a different way. I'm saying that I tend to believe it, but my belief cannot be too strong because, uh, because I only have one piece of evidence. Okay. So, uh, yeah, the actual formula is summarized toward the end of the the, the book. Uh, oh yeah, oh, we also have a formula here. You see, these are the Boolean version I just showed you before. Uh, then if you convert it according to the relationship between truth value and uh, weight of evidence, uh, this is the actual one that is used in the implementation. Okay? Uh, which uh, some people still have a problem with. Uh, and say, for example, why this one only depends on one of them? Well, I, I do have a justification for that. Uh, also, but we just don't have the time to talk about the detail, but I want to point out one thing. You see this confidence value? The frequency can still be everywhere because it only depends on the frequency of one of the conclusion. Because in this case, this one, this one actually play a different role with respect to the conclusion. Okay? Uh, this function, you see clearly uh, if k equal to 1, or in general, okay, you see these three things multiply together will clearly be less than 1. Okay. We will not even reach 1. Well, 1 is the limit. The same thing here. So the limit of this function is for uh, inductive inference. You always have for the conclusion You always have that. Especially if we are taking the current default value, k equal to 1, or accurately speaking, it will not reach that. Inductive conclusion, the confidence level cannot be more than 0.5, cannot reach 0.5. On the other hand, deductive conclusion, you see the upper bound is 1. So that's the answer to the traditional distinction. We always have, you know, everyone knows this, uh, deductive, non-deductive inference is less certain than deductive inference. Everything else being the same. Okay, here, what I'm uh, suggesting here is actually that uncertainty is on the second dimension. It's not about this one. Okay, this one can be anything. It can be one, no problem. It's just this one will be low, meaning that it's much more likely to be modified by future evidence compared to deductive conclusion. Okay. There are a bunch of other things we just simply don't have the time, uh, the time to talk about. Uh, I just want to say, uh, whenever you think about deduction in this uh, system, think about you, you should use the correct semantics. Don't treat it uh, as a probability. Don't treat it according to model theoretic semantics because it doesn't make sense. Or, or it will be simply wrong if you use that. Okay? Um, and if you can follow this discussion so far, then you should be relatively easy uh, to understand the next rule, abduction rule, because, because it's perfectly symmetric to induction. You see here, the common term uh, on the other side. So this corresponds to the situation where you collect evidence for the conclusion from their intentions. Uh, induction is about extension. You compare their extension. You compare their instances to decide whether they are one of one can be used as the other. Here you compare their properties. And also, by the way, I should mention that before the intuitive meaning of inheritance relation is this concept can be used 
is a special case of this. Or this one can be used as a generalization of this. Okay, the evidence is, is about to what degree that substitution is allowed or supported by evidence. Yeah. It's, once again, it's not about what is the reality. It's all about what is within the system. In, to what extent you can use one internal representation as the other. That's what reasoning is about in this system. Okay. So I'm not going to analyze this because you see it's perfectly parallel. It is the one and the two gets switched because of the you know the relationship. And uh, also there are interesting this uh, relationship between this and the traditional uh, thing. And also, you see, that's another way people have been thinking, talking about in, in different contexts. They say that abduction and uh, induction are uh, reverse the deduction, which is perfectly the case in this model. If we ignore truth value, okay, you see this is deduction. Uh, if you switch this one and this one, you get this pattern. If you switch this one and this one, you get this pattern. The angle picture is kind of like, this is deduction, okay? You always follow the same direction of your premise, then you get a strong conclusion. And the induction on the other hand is this. Okay, this you can also see it as transitivity, but you will have to turn this thing around to go that way. And abduction, on the other hand, is this picture. Once again, you have to turn something around to, to treat it as, as a transitivity. So intuitively speaking, you can treat all inference as using one term as the other. Uh, but there is a direction. If you violate the direction, you can still get an answer, but you cannot get a strong one. You can get a weak one. Okay. So that, that's the intuitive way to remember uh, the relationship be, uh, between the three. And uh, theoretically speaking, that's the whole possibility. Okay. And, and there are a couple of other rules, uh, like a conversion rule that say that from a single relation, how can you do uh, just, just directly turn it around? Uh, in a system, is allowed, and it will actually be taken as a special, special case of this or this, which you can read by yourself. And the last form is the opposite of deduction. Okay? It's kind of like how can you use, use one example to support a conclusion, which is called X amplification, it's the wrong name. Uh, it's the, you see, it's a transitive, but if it's pure transitive, it should be from P to S, but if you say uh, from S to P, well, you can also say that, but again, that's a, a form of non-deductive inference. So the conclusion have a confidence level less than 0.5, okay? Again, we don't have to talk about the detail, but uh, in summary, that's the truth value function, only this one, can give you a strong conclusion, or the other three give you a weak conclusion. And you'll see uh, also this one can only give you a positive conclusion. It, it cannot give you anything less than one, which is kind of interesting. But if you think about it, it actually makes some sense. And I will briefly talking about backward inference. Backward inference in the system, as I said, uh, means to derive conclusions, uh, derive questions from a given question. In a sense, there's no new rule. It's just all the rules I just introduced can be used backwards. Say, for example, deduction. From this one and this one, you can derive this one, right? We know that. Now let's think about what if I have a question about this relation. And I don't have an answer which is already there in the system, okay? But I know this. Then what? Then I can derive a new question in this way. Why? Because as soon as I find the answer for this one, 
that answer plus this one should be able to answer this one using deduction, right? It just go backwards in uh, what you can do using an inference rule, okay? Uh, so that, uh, so technically you see that the, two, the, the rule table is the same, I have it here. It just, one of the premise is the question itself, and uh, also the conclusion is the question under the condition that as far as that question is answered, this question plus this one to forward inference, you eventually get answer to the original, okay? So uh, now, uh, now from level one, can do both forward and backward inference using the same rule set. Uh, that's another interesting property. Yeah, I'm done on time, good. Uh, of this term logic, very interesting. <clears throat> Again, is this triangle uh, structure. That is, among the three, okay, there are three possible relations. If you know two of them, you can derive the third one. Okay, the other way around. That thing, that thing is unique in term logic. You don't have that in, uh, say, predicate calculators. Why I go back, now give me a few minutes to talk about why I said this is a bad thing. Predicate calculators, if there is only one uh, argument, you'll see pretty naturally map to what I have here. Not exactly the same, okay? What they call a predicate name pretty naturally corresponds to a predicate term. And what they use as a single argument naturally corresponds to the subject term, okay? But what's the difference? Well, some people may think this is just a matter of format, okay? You can write that in, no. In this picture, subject and predicate are defined relative to each other. It's just a matter of position, right? So we already see in our rules, the subject of one sentence can be the predicate of another sentence, no problem. Can you do it here? Here, the predicate name and the argument name, you know, come from two different domains, right? If you want to have a predicate of a predicate, that's a higher order logic in predicate calculators. So in a sense, the distinction between this and this are ontological. If, if you are a predicate, you are always a predicate for your whole life, okay? On the other hand here, your predicate, you just uh, your predicate for this sentence. You can be the subject of another sentence, which have a lot of implications. One implication is this, okay? This elegant relationship between deduction, abduction, and induction, you don't get it here. Yeah. And some, some other uh, Nice property of uh, term logic will be introduced in the future, but uh, one conclusion I, I want to mention today is, you see, uh, if you check the, the history of logic, people, all the book tell you, Aristotle logic is term logic, which is a very limited form, okay? Uh, then first order predicate calculators is a much more powerful system compared to uh, term logic. So term logic is already dead, okay? Uh, uh, predicate calculators is the king. Now you see that I agree that kind of thing is justifiable within the domain of mathematics. For, for as a mathematical logic, there is indeed a reason to prefer this thing to this. Okay? But for AGI, I want to make the claim, even though I haven't given you all the evidence, this is a much better choice than this, okay? Because after all, the logic of cognition or intelligence have some fundamental difference from a mathematical logic or the logic of mathematics, okay? Once again, I'm going to repeat this again and again in the future with, with different evidence to support my conclusion, okay? 
But roughly speaking, that is a whole complete non-axiomatic logic, layer one, with the grammar rule, semantics, and uh, uh, inference rules. Okay. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to talk about if we don't build further, which will be lived for next week. Tomorrow, I'm talking about if we just only want to implement that in a computer system, then what's the corresponding memory structure and the control mechanism for that to happen? Okay, okay that's all for today. Mm -hmm. If you're not hungry, okay, I have no problem to take some questions. Uh -huh. Because it looks to me like, from what I gather, is that uh, non axiomatic logic has foundation in first order logic. Yes and no. Yeah. So, could you summarize the difference and the similarity? I actually have that for a future lecture. Okay. But, uh, briefly, qu very quickly speaking, is this the yes part is I'm defining a logic using several meta theory, okay? Like that's the terminology I have been using to explain or to define the concepts here. The meta theory including something I built myself, also including something which is already there, predicate logic, set theory, and so on. I use those language to describe what I have. So if I don't have them, I, don't, I cannot explain clearly what I have. That's the yes part. But the no part is, this is a meta logic. So when we say something is on the, based on the foundation of something else, there's two different meanings, okay? Two common meanings. One meaning is like this. You're using one language to define another language. Another one is, you're using some theory as the core of another one, okay? So in that sense, I will say my system is not an extension of any of those things because, because it, it makes some assumption which con contradict with the fundamental assumption of those things. For example, I use the term uh, set theory to define intention and extension, okay? But I'm not saying that every term is either an element of a set or a set itself. But its meaning can be captured by two sets, which are its extension and intention. So I'm using it in this sense, but not in this sense. Okay. The same thing is true for predicate calculators, just one minute. Later we'll see that uh, I will use many ideas here, but this system doesn't completely follow the truth table of uh, predicate calculators. Same thing for probability theory. I use probability theory to explain a lot of things, but I don't assume probability axioms among my system's beliefs. And a uh, couple, couple more questions. Uh, so when you mentioned the triangle, mm -hmm. They are some, not very strongly. There are some similarity, yes. Right. In, in that sense, yes. And uh, last question. Mm -hmm. How can your logic be evaluated? So if I wanted to see how true is it, your, your interpretation of the system, uh, have you evaluated it and how? Uh, what I have been doing today is to provide a lot of arguments to try to convince you this is the right thing to do, okay? Uh, if we say that's kind of uh, evaluation, then it is. Well, in the sense that I'm providing you, I think I, at least I'm self-consistent. I'm providing you evidence to support my theory. I cannot provide proof because 
every proof assume a starting point, which typically is another established theory. Say that according to science theory, if you believe that, you have to believe me. I cannot do that because any other theory doesn't assume what I want to assume. Yeah, I was more thinking, given a hundred assertions or a hundred statements, can I issue one by one test your logic against the classical logic? Yes, you can. But if they don't agree with each other, what, what you can say? You cannot say, I'm wrong because I don't agree with... <laughs> then you just want to see the difference. I can show you the difference. Yeah, I, I, I already begin to show you some of the difference. Later I will show you more difference. But I agree with you. Evaluation is always a big problem for me from the very beginning. Because this theory, as I, I make it very clear, is not based on a traditional theory. And that, under that situation, also is not empirically testing. Uh, uh, it's not empirical theory, on the other hand. So how can you evaluate it? No, no, I'm going to think about it when I come up with something. Okay, that would be wonderful. Okay, thank you.